Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that bugging you? Oh, oh, thank, oh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Um, um, where my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet God? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why are you, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of the Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your mighty waterfalls. All your waves, your breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes haunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Lord God, we are frail children of dust. We are feeble as frail. But in you, we do trust. May that be our prayer this morning. As we reflect on our last week, things times in which we said, no, we don't trust you, God. Where we've acted outside of your care and your direction, your love. Lord, may confess, we confess that and we acknowledge that and we say, please come in your mercy and grace. Thank you that we do have a hope, a living hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for your mercies. They are tender. They're firm to the end. Your everlasting love, your steadfast love. You are our maker, our defender, our redeemer, and our friend. So may we celebrate with great joy, not just with our voice, but with our whole being. In Jesus' name, take us to the Father. By your spirit, we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows. It's grip on me, you have 
Yeah. 
about the piano. I we we will we will give you all our worship. We will give you all our praise. We alone we long to worship. You alone are worthy of our praise. If you'd like to just declare it, then just quietly or out loud, who God is, why is he worthy of our praise? You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of our praise. Yes, Lord God. Amen. Um, we're going to teach, well, it's probably not a new song, but it's new to us. And we have uh, Rianne from, she came all the way this morning, drove over late last night to come Saskatchewan to come and lead us in this song because I didn't know it and um, and then we got some other people here too who are going to help no you're not going to help well, well I don't I shouldn't have the mic because I haven't really Suffered and crucified for 
raised from the dead because of the love of the Father. We praise you and we thank you. Thank you that when you return to the Father and you're interceding for us, that you also then gave us your spirit to encourage, to teach, to strengthen, to convict, to be with us, to be your presence. So we want to give you praise. We worship you in Jesus' name. As we come to your word, uh, I, may we, the declarations we've made this morning, may they help us and may they lead us again to hear what your word, what you are saying to us this morning. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I'm supposed to pray for Daniel. Lord, we pray for Daniel. He needs it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's, I'm just obeying my wife, and you're over there. You're over there. Yeah, you're right in the middle. Yeah, you can be where, well, you can be wherever you want. You can be at the back if you want. Yeah. You've got that. Um, this. You've got this. There. That's what you want, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm on, maybe. Somewhere. Are you going to introduce yourself, or should I introduce you? Uh... It's risky to let me introduce yeah, you. Yeah, it is riskier. <laughs> um, although this Apple product, I have to figure out how it works. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm hailing from Fruitvale. I was here participating in the chaos that was uh, at the Danilux, if you heard it, going on. And if you see me moving slowly this morning, it's... Uh, the cost that I'm bearing for being the Dutch Blitz champions wow. yesterday. Uh, so, just throwing that out there. My quads are not happy with the sprinting I was doing. Um, but yeah, Mark invited me to speak with you today, probably more so that he didn't have to because he was so busy with all the family and things. Um, but I'm going to be sharing today... Uh, 
a quote with you, and we'll dive into that. But first, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to come before your people and share uh, what you've put on my heart. God, I ask that you would speak to them through me, Father, and cause what you want to say to come through. God, and if there's anything that is just of me and that you don't want, God, that you would cause it to fall away, Father. But I just ask that you would be here, open our hearts, and open our ears and our minds to understand, Father. And help my voice last in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, this morning, this is weird, I'm not used to two stands. This morning, we're going to be speaking about one of the great issues that has faced the Christian church throughout the centuries. It was put on my heart to speak to you today about how we should relate to each other as the church. And what I mean by that is both the church that's here today and the church global, the body of Christ. It was put on my heart today to share this quote with you. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. This was written by, I'm going to butcher this name, Rupertus Meldenius in 1627 in the midst of the Thirty Years' War. For those of you who are wondering, the Thirty Years' War was a war between Catholics and Protestants in Europe stemming from the rapid growth of Protestantism following the Reformation and the theological disagreements that came along with that. It was a war between Christians that caused between 4.5 and 8 million people to die. A war between Christians. So when I share this quote on a topic of unity, I'd say that old Rupertus had some skin in the unity game. Unity was one of the things that Jesus himself prayed about often. I dare say, because of that, it's almost like God wants us to think hard about it. So today we're going to be diving into unity. We're going to be asking ourselves the what-if questions, because I like questions. Because it's one thing for me to stand here and preach to you to be unified in truth, to be unified in Christ, and another thing to see what that looks like when the rubber meets the road. Because it doesn't take long if you look at the state of the church today and realize that perhaps despite our best efforts and our understanding that we should be unified, there's a lot of people who think they are the only ones that have it right. They're the only ones that have the right perspective on pursuing Christ. And it doesn't take long to see the division that that causes in the world around us, in the church. So I want to lay a little bit of groundwork here quick. Firstly, our unity is to be driven and founded by a common pursuit of Christ and not just the desire to please other people. You see, an important facet of pursuing unity is that sometimes people do need correction. Sometimes there are people professing things that fall outside of Orthodox Christian teaching and belief, but there's also a lot of times people who just simply believe a different perspective on minor things than us. The question I want to begin to explore with you today is how do we navigate those situations? And here is where the quote for the day comes back in. In essentials, unity. I'm going to start with that first part. And this quote nicely creates a good three-point sermon, so it should be easy for you to remember for the quiz after. <laughs> so, in essentials, unity. Why should we seek to be unified? I had a friend that once asked me a few years ago what I thought the biggest issue facing the church in Canada was. And he was expecting an answer along the lines of politics, persecution, or maybe declining attendance. But after a moment of thought, the answer I gave him was division. And I don't think it's only the church then, or even now, that that was the biggest issue for. Again, it doesn't take very long to look at the history of the church to see the damage that division has done both to people and to the church's witness. 
Christians have disagreed over the centuries from the most mundane things like the color of the carpets, and I kid you not, there have been Baptist denominations created over that very question, <laughs> to literal wars being fought between Catholics and Protestants, as we already mentioned, the Thirty Years' War. A little historical tidbit for the historians in the room. Did you know that the famous Swiss neutrality on the world stage came about as a direct result of people having a deep reaction and desire not to repeat the horrors of European inter-Christian warfare? This is why unity was the key thing that Jesus prayed for in John 17, 20 to 23. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, in them and you in me, so that the world may be brought to complete unity. So that they may be brought to complete unity, sorry. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. In this prayer to the Father, Jesus went as far to proclaim that the world's belief that he is sent of God hinges on our unity. Let that sink in for a second. It's something worth remembering the next time we want to be quick to differentiate ourselves from the other people. Our ability to be unified in Christ is to be a testament to the world that Jesus, and therefore us, we are actually of God. Now that I've given you a keen motivation, I hope, to be unified, that the world may know that Jesus is sent from God, the question we have, or the question I have at least, shifts to, well, in the quote, what are the essentials? These are things that form the core of the Christian faith. Another way that people have spoken about these in the past is by calling them gospel issues. In other words, they are things that directly affect the gospel in its understanding. So essentials in this paradigm would be things like the belief that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God who came to earth and lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died and resurrected and is now enthroned with the Father. Another example would be how Paul often uses the language of being in Christ to define our unity. He says in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here Paul expresses the core element of Christianity as identification with Christ. Another way to summarize the essential beliefs would be to look at the ancient creeds. One of the most ancient creeds we can see in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 12.3. It's simply the statement, Jesus is Lord. Jesu Kyrio. It's one of the most basic tenets of Christianity is the Lordship of Christ. And at the time that it was written, that phrase was a direct challenge to the lordship of Caesar. You see, a, a popular phrase then would have been Kaiser Kyrio, Caesar is Lord. And it's a simple summary for the Christian of Jesus' lordship over their life. And in proclaiming that lordship, they can be unified with others who do likewise. So this is an example of an essential. You see, the lordship of Jesus is something that Christians from all persuasions, be it Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, Orthodox, etc., can be unified around. We can all be unified in our pursuit of Christ and identification of his lordship over us. Another example of a creed would be to look at the Nicene Creed from 325 AD. 
you might catch what we just sang about in it. And I'm going to read through it for you. It starts by saying, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day He rose again according to the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic or universal and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life in the world to come. Amen. As you can see, the breadth and depth of such creedal statements can go from a simple Jesus is Lord to statements like the Nicene Creed. They can be expansive. But ancient statements like this can be helpful for us to see what is essential in a few ways. The first is that it isn't just me deciding what's essential. We are leaning into well over 2,000 years of Christians walking with God, guided by the Holy Spirit, who also affirmed these things as essential. So I've given you a basic idea of some things that could be essential, but if you're like me and what I just hinted at a second ago, and like to probe the limits, the question for me shifts to who decides what is essential? The answer we all implicitly want, at least I would say that for myself, is me. I get to decide what's essential. But the right answer is that God decides what's essential. Now, the tricky part is discerning what that is. I'm not, trying, I'm not going to make it easy for you this morning. You see, the reality is that there's no way to be 100% sure this side of heaven. We have a good idea on a lot of things, like those creedal statements, but the nature of being human is we can't be sure. That is why participating in community is important. It's important to not just be lone wolf Christians, as you will. We need others around us to challenge us and guide our views through mutual, dedicated pursuit of God. By participating in a community that has its roots in Christian history, we also participate in tradition. Now for myself, coming from a Pentecostal context, the word tradition can be a scary word. But we also need to allow ourselves to be guided by a shared belief over many centuries that have guided Christians before us. It's rooting ourselves in common teachings such as the creeds that can ground us and unify us together. That's what I just said a minute ago, that we can lean into the experience and discernment of 2,000 years of Christians guided by the Spirit. It doesn't have to be just us. That is what the creeds are. They're communal declarations of common faith. This we believe. We also, of course, need the presence of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. We need God to guide us on our journeys. And all of these things came together to shape the ancient creeds we just talked about. They were crafted by a community with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That is why they're an excellent starting point in helping us determine what is essential. 
Now, it would be tempting to take the easy road out when someone asks what's essential and just point to the Bible and say, well, this is what's essential and it's that simple. And don't get me wrong, there is truth in that statement. But it's also true it's not that simple. And why do I say that? Well, it's important to realize that despite clever acronyms from its name, the Bible is not an instruction manual dropped out of heaven on what makes a good versus a bad Christian. What I mean by that is that the text that we have, the Bible, it's a record of people's encounters and relationships with the living God. The first, there's two key aspects of that statement. The first is the most important. The text deals with encounters and relationships with the living God. This means that God influenced, guided, and shaped the text and that there are true elements to it that point us in the right way to live. I want to be clear that I'm not trying to undermine the authority of Scripture. It is God's Word, living and active, and has the power and authority to shape our daily lives. However, the second key aspect to that statement, that the Bible is a record of people's encounters with God, is important to remember. What do I mean by that? You see, we, humanity, people, we're not perfect. I don't know if that's news to you, but we're not perfect. And like it or not, we, humanity, are involved in the writing and the interpretation of Scripture. And so anything that involves us will by necessity carry some of that imperfection. And that may seem scary, but for some reason it's the way God chose to work. And isn't that inconvenient? <laughs> Wouldn't it have just been easier for God to just leave us out of it and drop a book of teaching and rules out of heaven? It's tempting to want that. But the amazing reality is that God instead chose to use broken humans as part of telling his story. And I can't tell you why he did that, but as a broken person, I'm glad he did because it speaks volumes to me of his love for me in my brokenness. All of that by way of saying, we can have a pretty good idea of what is essential using the creeds, community, the Holy Spirit, but we can never be 100% sure because ultimately we are involved in the process. And again, that can be scary. But it's because of that that why over the course of history, the church has put guardrails in place, so to speak, to help us. We've already touched on them. This is what being involved in community that can challenge us and correct us is all about. This is what being in touch with church tradition and tapping into 2,000 years of Christianity is all about. This is what being guided by the Holy Spirit is all about. They are guardrails to help us. Another easy guardrail, if you will, is thinking about whether something is a gospel issue. We kind of started here. This can be a helpful way to identify what might be essential. For example, when facing an issue, ask yourself, is believing this something that would affect our salvation? For example, is Jesus the Son of God? Yes, probably an essential issue then. Was humanity created before or after the animals? Because Genesis 1 has it one way, Genesis 2 has it another. Does it affect our salvation? No, probably not an essential issue. Now to be clear, there can, there can also easily be arguments about what constitutes a gospel issue. If there's anything I know about people like me, it's that we like to get into the nitty gritty and argue. That's why I wouldn't advocate for this as a rule, but as a tool to help us put what we're talking about in a wider perspective. Help us take a step back for a second. The problem though is, as I just said, we're people that like to be right. And there will be other people who profess faith in Christ but hold different beliefs than we do that might be non-essential. So what do we do? Well, that's where we move to the second part of the quote. In non-essentials, liberty. Really? Others can have 
believe different things than us and still be called Christians in non-essential things? Yes. Now, we kind of already answered this, but this is because none of us are perfect. Now, that seems like a bit of a cop-out, because it kind of is, but it's also the reality. You see, we have the mindset that when it comes to Scripture, there is only one right answer, my way. But the reality is that we all come to Scripture, the text, with different lenses, different life experiences, different understanding, and dare I say, even different motives. So we can all look at the same passage of Scripture, and we might all come up with a different possible interpretation of what that Scripture is saying. Is that scary? Yeah. But if you look at the history of Christianity, it has happened once or twice. <laughs> it's easy to look at the text and say, well, they were all wrong, and I am right. I, Daniel, in the year of our Lord, 2024, on August the 11th at 10.48 a.m., I have been the first to be completely right about this passage. Now, when I say it like that, it seems silly, but we all do that. At its core, what this part of the quote is trying to acknowledge is this reality, that in non-essentials, liberty, we all come to the text with a different perspective. It's an acknowledgement that we as humans can get things wrong, so it would be foolish to allow ourselves to be endlessly divided and fractured over non-essential aspects of the faith. To be clear, this doesn't mean we abandon the pursuit of studying the text and trying to get to the bottom of things. On the contrary, it encourages us to dig deeper, to examine our lenses, to pursue after God and His truth, but we do so with an open-handed humility that we can't know everything. So, at this point, what should everyone's question be? Well, what are the non-essentials, of course? This is the flip side of our previous uh, question, what are the essentials? So let's summarize. If something isn't boiled down in the creeds, probably a non-essential. If it doesn't affect your salvation, probably a non-essential. I say probably because, well, you should know the answer to that by now. It's not to say that these things, by in being non-essential, are unimportant, but rather to say they are not of the utmost importance. A helpful way to see the non-essentials can actually be to just have a conversation with other Christians that agree on the essentials. Seems strange, but what do I mean by that? Go have a discussion with an Anglican, for example. Ask them how they have seen God moving in their life. I think the answers might surprise you that despite maybe a totally different style of worship or service, the Holy Spirit is just as active in their lives as well. In these discussions like that, it can help the non-essentials fade away as each side's common pursuit of Christ becomes the unity between them. This can give us perspective on what those non-essentials are. So, because of that, we can hold together in unity as Christians and still allow each other to not believe the same non-essential things. This is how, for example, I can go to a prayer or worship gathering with a group of Christians who don't think drums have a place in worship, even though I know I'm right and they're wrong. That was a joke, just to be clear. <laughs> this allows us to not be endlessly divided over things that, in the end, aren't of eternal consequence. It allows for our natural diversity in the global body to exist. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 20, says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. There's the unity. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And here comes the... Liberty. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And to step away from my notes for a second, I think that is a testament to the wonder of God that despite Jesus' prayer for unity and our failure to achieve that and the divisions that have been caused, he can use that to his glory in the diversity that he can bring about in the church and the unity despite it. We move now to the final part of our quote. In all things, charity. And even though this is the last part of the quote, it is the most important and the linchpin of the whole thing. Every other aspect of the quote must first operate in and be driven by this. To be clear, by charity, it does not mean what we mean in the modern sense of strictly giving to the poor. It means, if you will, a gift love. It is a love for others, not because they are lovable or intrinsically deserving of love, but it is a love for them as a gift, despite perhaps their unlovableness. It is a gift love that we extend because it was first extended to us in our unlovable state and because love himself dwells within us. That is what we are to extend to others in general, but other believers specifically. You see, our discussions and unity together in essentials should be grounded in this gift love. When we correct someone in essentials, we do it in a manner of charity, out of love. If it's not out of love, then we better not do it. And our liberty in non-essentials comes cloaked in this charity. We may not like or find lovable how the, that person worships, for example, but we extend charity towards them in liberty, and in so doing, we protect our unity. We also treat this liberty with respect and cloaked in charity, knowing that the other may not have the same perspective on liberty as you do. This is what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians 8, 9 to 13. He says, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For as someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. It is the idea that though we have liberty, we do not exercise that liberty without charity towards others. And ultimately, this charity, this gift love for others, is to be the defining mark of a disciple of Christ. You see, unity was a mark that we were sent from God, but love, charity, is a defining mark of being a follower of Jesus. John 13, 35 says, By this Oh, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this statement came following the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus. It comes following a depiction of humility, of lowering ourselves and serving others, of placing others before ourselves. This is the depiction of gift love. 
a love given to others despite what they are in their filthiness because it was given to us despite what we are in our filthiness. Charity should also drive our actions because of what we already talked about here this morning. We have no way this side of heaven to know if we're 100% right. We can rely on the guardrails we spoke about to be safe, but we need to be charitable because one day we will have to stand before God and give an account. And how silly will we feel when we are trying to explain to Him why we sowed division because we disagreed over the color of the carpets. So remember this morning, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Father, I thank you this morning for the unity that we can find in you, in your Son, as you are unified together, so we seek to be unified with you. God, we ask that you would forgive us for the divisions that we so eagerly sometimes pursue, just in a desire to be right. God, I ask that you would help us to cloak our lives, cloak our actions, cloak how we interact with fellow believers in charity, to remember the gift love that you gave to us first, Father. God, we ask that you would help us to remember these things as we go forth from here today, Father, that the next time we are tempted to sow division, that we would remember good old Rupertus and what he asked and sought for unity in the midst of strife, God. And that it would help us to put in perspective our situations. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In your name, amen. I don't remember what happens now, but I feel like it's a grilling of me. <laughs> oh, singing first. So I can slip out the door while we're singing. Um... So just before I forget, what? Oh no, we're still we're singing a song. Uh, just before I forget the sh the Schmitz that are here, make sure you fill out your evaluation forms of Daniel, and get them back to me by Tuesday. <laughs> Daniel, by the way, is dating my daughter Anna, so we have. Um, that's the the context there. Um, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Um, as you were saying that, the, telling the story of the, how many million people died? Uh, eight? eight yeah. Uh, you know, we, we believe our, we can, it's easy to believe that our society is going to hell in a handbasket. But I think they believed that back then. And um, again, When we get to Revelation, we'll talk about that. How's that? Uh, actually, possibly after First Peter. If I have time to properly prepare for it, please. Yeah, in about four years, maybe. As long as I need, buddy, as long as I need. But as you just learned this, you're going to be really, uh, you're going to be gracious to me, right? As you have always been. Thank you. Charity, charity, yeah. So I do think that, um, oh, where are we here? Yeah, this is the one. Uh, we're going to sing um, another declaration song, and we invite you to stand. And um, this one speaks, where am I here? I've got to get my life together. Just a second. <laughs> 